The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. When Jesus had finished reading, he rolled the scroll back up and sat back down. And the entire synagogue was looking at him intently, wondering what he might do next. Then Jesus says these words, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This morning we focus on our Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew word from the Old Testament that means anointed one. This morning we focus on our Messiah as we focus on his mission and we focus on the outcome in our lives. The Messiah was promised to come so that he could heal the brokenhearted and bind up the hearts of those who were in mourning. See, in many different situations in our lives, we find ourselves in grief and in mourning. Whether it be from a failed marriage, or with the loss of a loved one, or even damaged relationships between family and friends, there are aches and pains that we carry in our hearts and Christ came to alleviate those pains and take away that grief. In the Gospels, we're told about how he helped several mourners. Actually, on three separate occasions, Jesus raised people from the dead. The first time, he raised the daughter of Jairus. Jairus was a synagogue leader, and he approached Jesus one day and asked him to come back to his house so that he could heal his daughter, who was very sick. Shortly afterward, those, shortly afterward though, uh, there was a couple people from Jairus' household that came with some grim news. They said how that daughter had already passed away and really there was no need at all to bother Jesus anymore. But even after those people had lost hope, Jesus still came to Jairus' house and met that little girl. And he raised her back to new life as he simply said the words, get up. On another occasion, Jesus was walking outside the town of Nain and he saw a funeral procession coming outside of the town as they carried a little boy on a stretcher. The little boy was the only family that was left to his mother and now she was a widow all alone. Jesus looked at that funeral procession and he looked at that mother and he had compassion on her. So he stops the funeral procession and he raises that boy back to new life. He restores him to his mother and he comforts all those people grieving from that town of Nain. But of course we can't forget about Lazarus. Lazarus was Jesus' friend. He was also a friend to the disciples. And once while Jesus was away with his disciples, their friend Lazarus passed away. And then he was buried in the tomb. In fact, four days had already passed before Jesus and his disciples came back to see where Lazarus lay. Some people thought, well, if Jesus had only been here, he could have healed Lazarus, and he would have never died in the first place. And maybe some, some of them even thought, well, if he was there right when he died, too, he could have raised him back up from the dead, but now it's been four days, and he's already started to decompose. Surely he's beyond Jesus' power to heal. Still, Jesus goes out to the tomb of Lazarus, and he has the people roll that stone away, and he commands Lazarus, again, simply by saying, come out. And to the surprise of many, 
they saw their friend Lazarus walk right out of that tomb, even as he was still wrapped in those grave clothes. And so Jesus offered hope and comfort to all those mourning Lazarus' death. But Jesus doesn't only comfort by raising people from the dead. He also comforted people with his words. See, to that widow at Nain, who he had compassion on, he also told her the words, don't cry. I mean, also to Lazarus' sister, Martha, he encourages her by promising her, your brother will rise again. And in fact, both of these two phrases are something that we as Christians can say at funerals to those who are grieving. We know that all our lost relatives will rise again in Christ. And we know that we don't really have to keep crying over them. Because finally in heaven we'll be restored to all believers. Going down the Messiah's job description, we also see how he was sent to heal the blind and restore sight to them. In fact, there were several occasions during Jesus' earthly ministry where he healed the blind. But he didn't just do it to those who were physically blind, but also to those who were spiritually blind. See, he, he fixed our deeper spiritual problems as you and I were born spiritually blind and spiritually dead. Just as he was able to fix those with the physical problems, he's also to fix, able to fix us with our spiritual problems. When we were spiritually blind, we were walking around in darkness, completely unable to find God, to find his mercy or grace or compassion. We were born spiritually dead. In fact, we were unable to do anything at all spiritually. We were in a completely hopeless situation. But with Christ, the impossible becomes possible. He still reaches out to those who mourn, especially those who mourn over their sins. Just like he said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Grief and mourning and sorrow is the exact reaction that Christians have when they read God's law. See, we recognize that we haven't lived up to God's standard of perfection. We recognize that too often we don't do what he wants and instead follow what we want. We don't put God first. We're selfish and greedy. During the time of Christmas, all too often we can either focus on the presents that we're going to get, or we wonder how we're going to pay for it all, and we're filled with anxiety and worry. And in all this, it shows a lack of trust in God to provide, and a lack of trust in God to control all the situations in our lives. See, sometimes we can even get to the point where we wonder, can any good come out of this situation? And you can start to doubt is God really in control of this? But Christ has mercy on us sinners. Whatever we lack spiritually, even though we're born spiritually blind and deaf and dead, Christ is able to make up for it. He brings us into a right relationship with God through the cross. He took upon himself all that blindness our deafness and how we're spiritually dead, and he nails it to the cross, completely taking it away from us forever. Christ fulfilled his mission to preach the good news to the poor, to those who came to him, weighed down by the weight of their sins. He gave words of comfort and peace. He lifted those burdens as he says, "My yoke is easy and my burden is light." He does the same thing for us today. He promises us that he has fulfilled the law completely for us. And there's now nothing left on our part to do. We just have to trust in him. 
While Jesus did do a lot of physical healing through the miracles, we have to remember that he didn't heal everybody in Israel. There were still people walking around blind. There were still people who couldn't walk. And we have to remember that because today, Jesus doesn't always heal through, through miracles. We don't expect Jesus to heal us if we become blind or have some kind of sickness or disease. Neither do we expect Jesus to heal our lost loved ones and raise them back up from the dead on this side of eternity. Still, we trust in Jesus. We trust that he's able to provide and fix all the things that sin brings into this world. Whether disease or death, as Christians, we recognize the, the Messiah's mission. And we recognize that change in our lives. Isaiah says it this way, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of, of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. You see, already today, each of you has already been clothed with Christ. God has already given you the righteousness that you lacked. Because in Jesus, he has earned for us those robes of righteousness. Through the cross, he took away all our sins and was able to exchange our dirty, filthy rags for his perfectly white robes. Since we believe in Jesus, we have this free gift, even though none of us deserve it. And wearing his robes of righteousness, we can stand confidently on the day of judgment before a holy God and his judgment throne. We know as we wear Christ's works and Christ's righteousness that we have nothing to be afraid of. So we can trust that when God looks at us and judges us, he's going to say, not guilty. In heaven, we're going to be reunited with all those who passed away before us. And we're going to get new bodies that won't wear out. We won't have joint problems or be bothered by any aches or pains. These new bodies we're going to get are going to last forever. And any physical malady is going to be a thing of the past. Since we've been given so much in Christ, we've got lots of good reasons to be glad. We've got lots of good reasons to thank God for all he's done for us. We thank God by listening to what he says and by doing his will. Of course, we don't do it in order to earn his favor. We don't do it to try and pay him back. Now we do what God wants because we want to thank him for all he's done for us in Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we're unable to live new lives for Jesus. Isaiah says it this way, For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Just as sure as spring rains cause sprouts to come up in the spring, so God will produce in us Christians fruits of righteousness. Jesus said it this way, I am the vine and you are the branches. If anyone remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. As Christians in Christ Jesus, we bear much fruit. Fruits of righteousness. It's those good works that the Holy Spirit produces in us. Through the Holy Spirit, we're able to drown that old Adam with all his sinful desires and live our new lives of faith as we constantly look for ways to serve God. So no matter where we are, or what we do, or what kind of family members we may have, we can live our lives in faith and do good works in thankfulness to God. This December, I want you to stay focused on Jesus, on that Messiah. Even as all the hustle and bustle of the Christmas season gets into full swing, 
Remember that baby in the manger? 